Well, it's a pleasure to be here and to see the number of people that I know. Um, I want to tell you right up front, you're not going to learn anything today from me that you can take home and do this spring. I'm going to talk a little about where no-till is and the cover crops. And if you're in no-till and cover crops, you're one of the real innovators in agriculture in this country and uh, are, are doing well. Let's see if I can make this work. All right, I grew up on a sixth generation uh, dairy farm. It was founded by our family in 1853, 40 miles north of Detroit. I was the sixth generation on the farm. I was the first male in six generations to leave the farm. My dad was an only child, so that helped. We did, uh, Ray Cook at Michigan State was one of the real innovators early on with minimum tillage. And he came up with this system called wheel track planting. All you did was plow. The next trip was with the planter. We did this for two years on our farm in the 1950s. If you wanted to find a way to have your kidneys fail, th this was the system to use. <laughs> My dad did it for a, a couple years. So we talk about no-till being new. There we go. Maybe this was no-till in the 1930s. Maybe this is double crappie. Here's somebody uh, probably um, harvesting wheat, probably following behind them with uh, probably seeding a cover crop such as clover or something. Maybe this was no-till in the 1930s before we ever knew what was, what was really happening. So some of the early day uh, no-tillers that started small, like with uh, Alice Chambers' two-row no-till planters, and uh, came up, and but they got, got started. A lot of these uh, were not planted along the highway, but back in the woods or behind the woods where their neighbors wouldn't see what they were doing. Bauman's Folly, this is an actual book that my dad had bought probably in 1945 or 1946 that Edward Faulkner had put out. No one has ever advanced the scientific reason for plowing. Now, Faulkner in those days didn't really have the concept of what's turned into no-till, but he was one of the early day pioneers that saw that plowing wasn't working that well for us. Rocky start for no-till, and one of, the, one of the big benefits early on for no-till is you didn't have to go out and pick rocks anymore. And, uh, I remember picking rocks as a kid. And one of the things that bugs me today is I go in the garden store and I see a big rock for sale for $75. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> but it really, it really took off in uh, 1962 or so on the Harry Young farm in Herndon, uh, Kentucky, in western Kentucky. Seven tenths of an acre. Um, he had been to the Dixon Springs uh, Experiment Station in Southern Illinois the previous year and saw that George McKibben was making no-till work and he thought, I can come home and I can do that. And two other pioneers that you may recognize their names here. Eugene Keaton, he uh, developed the uh, seed firmer and Howard Martin came up with the road cleaners. These were people that were in Harry Young's area and they decided that they were gonna make no-till work. The planter on the left is what they were using in the early days at Dixon Springs to uh, uh, plant. I think, the, I think we've come a ways for down pressure since we've had the guy standing on the back. <laughs> but the international planter up there was what Harry Young used to plant no-till in the early days. And that was an old uh, tobacco type planter that he found sitting in the uh, fence row someplace, they made some welders, they made some modifications, he put some coolers on it, and that's what he planted. And then in the bottom figure, that shows him planting some of their uh, test plots into, into what was probably a cover crop. So we've been, we've been talking about no-till since 1972, and that's when no-till farmer got started. And there were 3.2 million acres of no-till in 1972, 
and nobody was collecting this data. We actually did it ourselves. We went to the state agronomist of the Soil Conservation Service in every state and said, give us your best estimate of how many acres of no-till were no-till this year, and what's your guess for next year? And for a number of years, this was the only data out there. There wasn't anybody else doing it. Later on, the Conserva Conservation Tillage Information Center collected it for a while until government funds ran out. But the latest prediction that we seem to have is that there are 108 million acres in 2017, which is roughly 26% of the tilled cropland in the U.S. Worldwide, this is the uh, latest statistic that I could find, 388 million acres being gone, no-till. And while the U.S. will have the largest acreage of no-till of any country in the world, we don't have the largest percent that's being done for no-till. So if you look at worldwide, South America, particularly Argentina and Brazil, is way ahead of us on the percent of crop acres that are no-till. Now we have more total acres no-till, but percentage-wise, we only show up in third place because Australia and New Zealand are also ahead of us. But if you look at where no-till is done, we have 38% of the worldwide no-till acres. But we're way behind. Argentina, 93% of their tilled ground is no-till compared to about 26% of us. So where did the South Americans learn about no-till? Right here in the United States. They, they made a number of trips to the University of Kentucky. They had Kentucky agronomists go down and show them how to no-till, and it caught on down there like wildfire, much faster than it did here. So when you see that our big competitors in the world for soybeans are Brazil, we showed them how to do it and, and do it with no-till. There's a few dates here I want to talk about. 1961, George McKibben at Dixon Springs got no-till going. Harry Young uh, pioneered it on the commercial farm in Kentucky in 62. Alice Chambers came out with the first uh, no-till planter in about 1966. And we, we started no-till farmer in 1972. Two, two major things that happened that helped uh, the no-till catch on. 1976, Roundup came on the market. So up until then, we were pretty much using Paraquat and uh, for, for burn down and Roundup came on the market. And then later on, we got the GMO crops. But in 1985, the other big accomplishment is John Deere came out with the 750 drill. And up until that time, the major manufacturers we're not very keen about selling no-till, and I'm not so sure they are today either, because they'd rather sell big horsepower tractors and wide units. But the attitude among some farmers is, well, if John Deere is coming out with it, it must, must be going, it's green, it must be going to amount to something. But that's what happened. Field work, no-till, I don't have to tell you that, two to three trips. Minimum tillage, four to five trips. Conventional tillage, seven trips. You get in some areas of the San Joaquin Valley where they're doing vegetable production and they'll be making 15 trips. Now there isn't much no-till in California, but there is some, <coughs> there's probably uh, been more growth in California with the big dairies with silage with strip till or no-till, but we still haven't licked all the problems for these vegetable people out there yet. So one of the things we talk about today doing is planting green. And you go back to 1972 when we were doing this, and a number of the farmers were no-tilling corn into alfalfa sod. And some of them would take a hay crop off like the gentleman is doing in the upper right, and then come back in and no-till corn after that. So in reality, this was in uh, Northwest Illinois. In reality, we were double cropping with no-till even in those days. And, getting into residue. So there's some problems with residue in, in, the, in those days. And the plant pathologists had the answer. Anytime it's a problem, just bury the residue. And we still have some plant pathologists today that tend to give out that advice. Not many, but some. 
So any, any, new, any new disease comes along, they'll tell you, bury the residue. This is one of my pet peeves. You hear about soil health today and how important it is, and what is it? It's no-till, cover crops, rotations, mm -hmm. sustainability. These are, every one of these things, is, with the exception of regenerative ag, is what no-tillers have been doing for decades. Now, regenerative ag is new, but you no-tillers don't get enough credit for what you've been doing in the soil health field up until now. Now, we're doing much more than we did in the past, but uh, there's still a way to go. Planting green. Maybe it's not so new. This was uh, somebody in the, either the late 70s or early 80s, uh, no-tilling soybeans into uh, probably 15 or 20 inch rows at the time. Two Steiger tractors put together at the Farm Progress Show one year, 650 horsepower. I came home and figured out if you had all that horsepower, you could hook up a 260 row no-till planter. <laughs> the headline, headlands would probably be a major problem. <laughs> About 10 or 15 years ago, we started doing a benchmark study on what, what amounted to our, our readers and what they were doing each year. And uh, we do this each, each, each winter. So I'm gonna give you a, a profile of what the typical no-till farmer is like today. These would be our no-till farmer subscribers. They're averaging close to 1,500 total acres, 455 acres of corn, 500 and acres of soybeans, and 80%, 88% have been no-tilling for more than six years. Tillage practices, 93% are no-tilling, strip tills used by 19%, vertical till by 24, and minimum tillage on 21. So most of these farmers, a number of these farmers aren't 100% no-till, they may have some problem acres, they may some have some river bottoms, et cetera, so they're doing a number of things. No-till profitability, this is from 2018. 72% of our readers were showing a profit with no-till, 11% had a bad year and didn't make any money that year, and 17% were flat. Now, when it comes to glyphosate use, only 7% were using it as a Roundup or one of the generics as a fall burn down. Spring burn, burn down went to 57, pre-emergence 27, and post-emergence were being used by 65%. In soybeans, you can see the figures, 6%. The big figure was post-emergence and spring, spring breakdown. Among our readers, 41% were using a 16-row planter or, or larger. Average corn population was 32,000 uh, plants per acre, and 87% of our people were in 30-inch rows. Soybean equipment, 75 were using no-till planters, 33% used drills, 143,000 average plant population, and 54% were in 15 inch rows. What's interesting on soybean plant populations, there's been a number of studies done that shows this 142 would be way high. There are studies done where they planted as few as 80,000 plants per acre with no difference in yield. But most farmers are pretty scared to only put out 80,000 soybean plants per acre. But some of the research shows it's working. Systems costs. There they are, conventional tillage at 545, strip till at 480, no till and cover crops, much, much uh, best. There's all kinds of data. This is uh, some data that came out of Minnesota, which is not a big area for no till, but it's coming out of the Redwood County Soil and Water Conservation District. 
And they also show that the people using conventional were making a net profit of about $5 per acre, while the no-tillers were making a profit at wolf cover crops of $112 an acre. So what's a 1% increase in organic matter worth to you? It'll, it'll save you 20 to 25 pounds in nitrogen, phosphorus maybe five and a half pounds, sulfur two and a half pounds, and this is for each 1%. And we're seeing a number of no-tillers who've been able to increase their organic matter. Some have done really well, some it goes up more slowly. These pictures appeared in the first issue of No-Till Farmer we did in November of 1972. Hurricane Agnes had hit in Pennsylvania. There were 18 inches of rain in just a few hours. The conventional tillage loss was averaging 5.2 tons per acre. The no-till was only at 0 0.1. And these, these fields were across the county road from one another. One of our people shot these out the car window of his car, didn't even have to get out in the rainstorm. But it showed the conventional guy ended up with ruts. He had to go in with a bulldozer and fill some of these ruts. Nutrient loss. This includes uh, with that 5.2 tons on conventional tillage, 15 uh, pounds of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Now, I don't have to tell you this, but you know how much labor can be saved with no-till. And if you're an Amish farmer, man, this is the best, best thing that's come along in a long time. One of the rules of thumb is if you had one horse, you could probably plant, do the tillage and plant corn on 10 acres with one horse in, in, in 10 days. If you were no-tilling, that one horse could do 10 acres for you in one day. So the labor savings is definitely there. So on the 1,800 acres, if you were using conventional tillage, you could be, or if you were using no-till instead of this conventional tillage system, you could be saving 37 minutes per acre, which on 1,800 acres would be 1,100 hours a year or the equivalent of 27 weeks. Now looking at uh, reduced tillage, where we've gone, 77 million acres in 2012, 98 acres in 2017, which made up about 25% of the total crop land. Intensive tillage, 106 million acres in 2012, has dropped to 80 million acres by 2017. And when you look at the tilled acres, Intensive tillage, moldboard plowing, whatever, makes up 28% of the total. Reduced tillage, 35, and no-till, 37. I think this is the first time in history that the no-till acreage has been higher than conventional tillage or reduced tillage. So there's where it was in uh, 2017. Conservation Reserve was in there, conservation easements. The picture here is a uh, farmer in Markison, uh, Alan Brooks, who's in the vegetable production business. He's uh, seeding uh, in, in the fall in, in, with his no-till. He's been totally no-till for a couple of years, over a number of years. In fact, Alan has been to all 28 of our national no-tillage conferences. He's one of six people who's done this. And he tells the story about how he, went, he decided he was gonna no-till vegetables, particularly peas. And the cannery guy said, no, you're not. Well, you're gonna do tillage. And, and Alan said, no, I'm gonna no-till. And the guy said, you're gonna lose your contract a year from now. And Alan says, well, well, we'll wait and see. So he went ahead and no-tilled with the idea that they were probably gonna pull his contract. When it kind of came time to harvest, it was very wet in the area. And the only fields they could work in was where his no-till pea fields. They put five harvesters into his fields when they couldn't work any place else. 
and he had never never had another problem selling no-till to the uh, canneries. Which kind of reminds me of a story uh, during the French Revolution, going back a long time, there were three three gentlemen that were about to lose their about to lose their life on the guillotine. There was a priest, there was a politician, and there was a French farmer. First guy up was the uh, politician. They put him in the guillotine. They pulled the plug, and the knife came down and stopped. Didn't kill him. So the man that's running the machine says, "My God, this is an act of God." You're free, to, you're free to go. So they bring the next guy up. He's the priest. Same thing happens. Bring it down, doesn't kill him. And he says, my God, it's an act of God. You're about to go. The third guy comes up and it's the farmer. And all of a sudden he says, you know, I've been looking at that. If you, correct, if you tighten that bolt at the top, I think this thing will work. <laughs> Double cropping, this, is, uh, this was what really got no-till going in, the, in Western Kentucky in the early 70s and late 60s. They would plant a wheat, wheat or barley crop in the fall, harvest it in uh, June or July, and immediately come back and double crop soybeans as they're doing here in, into the stubble. Then the next year they would plant no-till corn. And this went on for a number of years. One of the advantages of barley is you could harvest a week or two earlier than the wheat, but there isn't much barley being grown anymore because of the price. Interesting enough, in Ohio, there's a, a farmer I know that uh, Ohio, like in many areas, had really bad planting conditions last spring, and the crops got planted late. This gentleman uh, didn't get his soybeans planted until June 29th, which they were not double cropped, they were just in the ground, with, but it's about when you would plant double crop beans. Those beans made 79 bushel per acre even when they were planted in uh, late, late June. Double cropping, there's all kinds of opportunities, differences. Uh, wheat and soybeans usually don't do too well north of a line through Indianapolis to Des Moines, but then there's, uh, there's people making it work. There's other opportunities, peas and then corn, and someplace up in like the central states here, you'll find people even triple cropping with no-till and uh, um, irrigation. So how big is big? This is a 212 foot wide cedar being used in Australia. The family farms 40 to 7,000 acres of wheat, barley, and chickpeas. They can do in an 18 hour day. This has got two tractors, uh, two tractors on it. In an 18 hour day, they can seed 2,500 acres. Cover crops. Here's Steve Groth, who talked to this group last year. And uh, Steve has uh, been a real pioneer in no-till, and he started a group called Cover Crop Innovators, which we purchased from him maybe two months ago, and we're now running. And Steve is, while he's still involved in cover crops, he's really involved in hemp production, and he's got, got a group going on, uh, on hemp. So when you look at the typical no-tiller in terms of cover crops, 79, our benchmark study shows 79% are doing them. They're seeding cover crops on an average of 470 acres. 54% are using multi-species. 13% are grazing cover crops. And 77% are, are uh, seeding after corn and soybean production in our harvest in the fall. So when you look at cover crops nationwide, no-tillers, 80% of them are no-tilling, or are seeding cover crops, yet only about 2% of all growers across the nation are using cover crops. In uh, the Rulon brothers in uh, Indiana have shown that they're making a return on their investment of about 
6% with using cover crops to the uh, reduced fertilizer cost, reduced fertilizer, whatever. And uh, I, I remember in the 40s and 50s on my, our farm at home, my dad used to, we used to cut corn for silage for the dairy herd, and then we would uh, see the cover crops such as clovers. But we seemed to get away from this as we got into the late 50s and into the 60s, and so now it's coming back. Most people say that uh, cover crops are paying. This is still some more data from the Minnesota uh, Redwood Conservation District. They're spending an average of $15 for seed, but it's saving them $32 in uh, tillage costs by uh, using cover crops and no-tilling compared to conventional tillage. Herbicide savings with cover crops, their data shows a 26% savings if you're no-tilling in cover crops compared to uh, conventional tillage. Fertilizer costs are about $95 less compared with conventional tillage and no-till cover crops. And it's netting them about 112 bucks an acre compared to five dollars and 25 cents for conventional tillage. So the cover cropped acres, 2012, we had about 10 million acres. It's increased to 15 million acres, but it only represents about four percent of our total cropland. So there's a tremendous uh, growth that can take place here. Several of you mentioned to me that you've been to the National No Tillage Conference, which the one we put on this year was the uh, 28th one. Um, we've never had less than 640 people, and I think we've had as many as 1,200 people. The first year we did it in Indianapolis, one of the people, on, we decided we were going to do this, and one of the people on my staff, I said, let's go down to Indianapolis and find a hotel to hold this in. So she said to me, how many people should we plan on? And I said, well, if we get lucky, maybe we'll have, let's plan on 150. If we get lucky, we'll have 200. So we registered 600 people and the hotel said, we can't take anymore. It wasn't sleeping rooms, it was the meeting rooms because we could put people in a different hotel. And well, he said, registration should still come in. What can we do? We finally ended up, I think that first year, with 840 people. But the hotel said we can do that under one condition. We said, what's that? And they said, it's not a good one. Okay, what it will be? And they said, we could feed one third of the people on the 26th floor and two thirds of the people on the bottom floor and then have them all come down for the noon thing. So that, that's what we did. We had outgrown this hotel before we ever set foot in it. And I remember a couple of things that happened at that very first meeting. Dwayne Beck from South Dakota, who's been a real advocate for no-till for many, many years, made a talk and I remember one thing he said, you no-tillers in Ohio, no-till to get rid of the water. In South Dakota, we no-till to keep every drop that falls. Now, another story from that first year was a gentleman from around Bay City, Michigan, who had never no-tilled an acre in his life. And he called me up in February and said, I just sold all my tillage equipment. I'm going 100% no-till this year, 1,200 acres. And he'd never no-tilled an acre before in his life. He made it work, it, it worked. And over the years, I've had two other people tell me the same thing. There was somebody from around La Crosse that went from cold turkey on 900 acres. And there's another gentleman in the middle of uh, Illinois that uh, I think went no-till 100% of 1,800 acres. Now, when these guys call, the first thing I try to do is talk them out of no till <laughs> At that point, if you want to try 40 acres or 50 acres, fine, but uh, don't do that. This is Alan Brooks I was talking about, the Markison guy. He's been all 28 of our conferences, one of six to do that. It reminds me of the uh, man from La Crosse one year, four or five years ago, 
had just bought, well, maybe it was longer than that, like 10 years, because he had bought a brand new Buick, and I don't think he'd buy a Buick anymore. He bought a brand new car, and the first trip he made was to Cincinnati for the no-till conference. So he was interested in how much gas mileage he was getting on this new car. So when he put it in the garage at the hotel, he wrote down the mileage, and then he figured it out. Four days later, when he went back to get his car, it had an extra 75 miles on it. <laughs> Somebody had been driving his new Buick around Cincinnati nonstop for three or four days. So we've, uh, we've done very well on this uh, conference, and uh, one of the uh, popular ideas today is 60-inch uh, corn with cover crops in the middle. We had a gentleman talk at our uh, 1996 National no Tillage Conference from South Africa, and they were growing corn in 60-inch rows. And they say one of the reasons for that is the elephants can get down between the 60-inch rows without wrecking the crop. Now, he says if you got rhinoceroses, they just tear the whole crop up. But uh, So um, then we had some people from Michigan when 20-inch corn rows were popular. And this gentleman uh, had 2,400 acres of 20-inch corn versus 30-inch, uh, and it was netting him an extra $50,000. So we're going... Wide rows to narrow rows, narrow rows to multi narrow, ultra narrow rows, and now back maybe back to 60 inch rows. So, what's going on with no till tomorrow? This was, uh, this was the USDA study in 1975 that showed that. 54% of all the land in America by 2010 would be no-tilled. We didn't come anywhere near reaching that and we're at only about 24, 25% today. So it didn't turn out the way it was. This is an article that's in our uh, latest issue of uh, no our conservation tillage guide. This is a farmer in uh, central Illinois, farms about 2,400 acres, had a 100 acre field that had been, chilled, uh, had been in no-till continuous for 30 years. One day a neighbor stopped and said, you better get out there, why are you chisel plowing this field? And 80 acres of this field had been chisel plowed by one of these big time operators with thousands of acres who got in the wrong field. So we took this to uh, three or four different guys and asked them what would happen. Some said it would take six years to fix. And then they said, if you wanted to, to tell the guy what he had to pay for doing this, you could certainly justify an $8,000 payment. And some of the others said, you're gonna need 20% more fertilizer than you had. Uh, than you have been using to fix this problem. So it's a total predicament that this guy got in just because someone uh, got in the field that they didn't belong. What's ahead? We're talking about electric tractors, autonomous tractors, robots. Uh, Agco has come out with these. Well, these are totally research things. They're not ready to go yet, but they, they've come out with these little units where you might have four or five working in one field um, seeding crops, the dot outfit off off the Seedmaster in uh, Canada is uh, an autonomous unit which you could hook up to a sprayer or a seeder, and we got autonomous tractors. I, I think one of the biggest fears farmers have today with autonomous tractors is they think it will forget to turn at the end of the row and end up in the ditch. We also we also had a uh, Farmer talked at the no-till conference three or four years ago about auto steering and GPS. And he said, with this situation, it's great to have your girlfriend in the cab with you because you don't have to pay attention to the, to the tractor or where it's going. Down here on the right is, uh, this, is, this is Blue River Technology, which John Deere has bought out. And this, is, this sprayer is set up 
to slice herbicide rates dramatically. They're only applying herbicide to weeds that they see growing in the field. So we're gonna see some big, big changes, no doubt about it. We still have major um, concerns with pollution in this country, the Chesapeake Bay, the uh, New Orleans and Lake Erie. Uh, phosphorus is a huge problem in, lake, in the western end of Lake Erie. Farmers are getting blamed for a lot of this. Uh, Ohio is spending a lot of money to uh, fix this and they're definitely blaming uh, farmers for it. Chesapeake Bay, uh, just tremendous uh, amount of money being spent here and all of a sudden now some of the states are saying Pennsylvania is not doing enough to do this. And in New Orleans, this is from nitrogen flowing down the Mississippi River from fields in Iowa, Illinois, Missouri, etc. So what's the future? We got 10, million, 10 billion mouths to field, feed. We got global warming that's, uh, some people say it's for real, some people say it's not, but it's a, a situation we gotta get fixed. Water usage. Some people will say, man, we got too much water this year. Well, we got a lot of dry areas where the uh, irrigation is important and the aquifer keeps going deeper and deeper every year. We're gonna have more serious concerns about curbing erosion around, around the world. And we've got some interest in organic no-till. Now, organic no-till is not too easy to do at this point, but there, we have some people doing it. And we had a, a lunch session during the no-till conference with some of the cover crop innovator people. And there were, there were two gentlemen from Ohio, um, cousins, and they're farming 1,600 acres. And their goal is to go 100% organic no-till within the next year or so. So it, it's being talked about, it's being concerned. Slicing herbicides, we just saw what John Deere's doing. Uh, cover crops is helping a lot of people reduce their uh, herbicide rates. Precision planting, uh, you, you've got uh, many things going on. It's not unusual for someone to buy a new planter, maybe 24 rows, it's gonna cost $300,000 with all the gadgets on it. Residue management, I've seen this go from calling it trash to farming ugly, to now it's residue management and diversified rotations. Uh, we seem to be stuck a lot on the corn and soybean rotation here in the Midwest. I've seen some people in Canada, in Western Canada with a 21 year rotation because of no-till. And as Dwayne Beck at uh, Pierre, South Dakota said, it sees real benefits in herbicide or weed control, insect control, disease control by diversifying your, your uh, rotations. We're definitely going to see more cover crops. There's emphasis on this. I don't have to tell you this, but we've got a long ways to go when only 2% of the farmers in America are actually using cover crops today. Sequestering carbon is another thing. We're going to see payments being made for this. Big question I have is if a no-tiller has been sequestering carbon for 10 years and the land goes to, say it's his land, he sells or rented land that goes to another farmer who uses conventional tillage or reduced tillage, do we lose all the carbon sequestration and can you go back and get the money back? Earlier no-tilling, um, we've got people that are uh, moving up their planting dates from mid-May to mid-April. There's a lot of interest today in planting soybeans at the same time you're planting corn or even earlier. At the first no-till conference in 1973, we had Howard Doster from Purdue University Economist who showed the benefits of planting soybeans at the same time you were planting corn and the results were uh, tremendous. And just recently I saw some data that shows early planting of soybeans may make you more money than having to delay corn planting because corn and the studies they did still yielded well even if it was planted late. Regenerative no-till, that's the new term these days. I'm sure you're gonna hear some more about it today. Uh, we got people 
using cover crops, uh, getting, uh, reducing costs across the board, running livestock, maybe sheep or beef cattle or goats or something. One of the problems for many people in the corn belts, they don't have any fences anymore. So they're gonna have to figure out what they're gonna do. Roberto Peretti was the opening speaker at our National No Tillage Conference a few weeks ago in St. Louis. He re refers to himself as a do-nothing farmer. He's been no-tilling in Argentina for 40 years. And during the drought, a neighbor across the road said to him, his field looked fine. The neighbor's field looked fair, terrible. And he said to Roberto, why is your field so much better than mine? And Roberto says, because I'm a do-nothing farmer. I didn't do anything to it. That's what I have just looking at no-till in the past, the present, and the future. Thanks very much.